Hello, and thanks for coming to our YouTube channel for this Ethical Hacking webinar. My name is Camille, and I'll be moderating the discussion. Today, we're not just going to talk about everything new in the world of ethical hacking. We're also going to see a demonstration from InfoSec instructor and channel favorite, Keytron Evans. Plus, just for clicking on this video, you can get free access to all of our ethical hacking courses and cyber ranges. Just go to infosecinstitute.com skills and sign up for an InfoSec Skills account using coupon code HACKING. You'll get instant access to 500 plus courses and hands-on training, including courses taught by today's guest, Keytron. The links for the free training and video code is in the description of this video. Happy hacking, now let's get started. So Keytron has fortunately come back for another webinar with us. Um, he's done several with us before and you know, always provides us great valuable insights and um, you know, real contemporary thoughts on the world of cybersecurity. So happy to have you with us, Keytron. Absolutely, thanks, glad to be back. Very good. Um, so wanted to talk a little bit about your background quickly. So Keytron is regularly engaged in training, consul consulting, penetration testing, and incident response for government, Fortune 50, and small businesses. So in addition to being the lead author of the best-selling book, Chained Exploits, Advanced Hacking Attacks from Start to Finish, um, you will see Keytron on major news outlets such as CNN, Fox News, and others on a regular basis as a featured analyst concerning cybersecurity events, issues, and, and other topics. Uh, for years, Keytron has worked regularly as both an employee and consultant for several intelligence community organizations on breaches and offensive cybersecurity as well as attack development. Keytron also provides world-class training for the top training organizations in the industry, and we're fortunate to have him as an instructor for our InfoSec Flex live boot camps, um, as well as an instructor on our InfoSec Skills on-demand skill development platform. So really a valuable person to have with us, and, and we thank you for joining us, Keytron. Yeah, thanks, glad to be back again. <clears throat> good, good. Um, so I guess let's kind of start out and talk about overall what's new in ethical hacking. Um, you know, how has this evolved? You've been in this industry for a long time, so so curious on your thoughts. Yeah, so um, obviously what what's happened, one of the things that we've seen happen over time is the whole concept of web applications and web app security, you know, kind of continue to gain importance. And what's happened over the last five years or so is that's even become more the case and that's mostly driven by uh, the massive adoption of cloud technologies you know where sure. everybody's migrating to cloud services so now if you think about that if you take all of your data and your applications and you move them into a cloud service provider how do you access those that data in those applications and it's mostly through some type of web application so um, that's put it even more to the forefront and what another interesting thing that's happened, and I kind of, I did a, a, a presentation on this back in 2012 when uh, people were really seriously starting to consider cloud. And that is now the, the bad guys are using cloud services as an attack vehicle. And that's kind of scary because they have unlimited resources there almost that they're able to utilize to do things that they weren't able to necessarily do um, in the past. So that's some of the stuff that's changed. We cover that stuff uh, in, a, in the new content that we provide. And that's kind of where we'll see, I think things going more is cloud services and web apps. These are kind of become more of the important things to you know, try to lock down and try to pen test. Sure. Um, now, overall, what does an ethical hacker actually do? I think that's that's kind of where people, you know, outside of the industry or even within the industry is like, hey, you're a hacker, right? Like, what do they actually do? <clears throat> yeah, so basically, and the most important thing is when we do penetration tests or ethical hacks, we the, the first thing that happens is we uh, generally go out and we assess what the customer needs. We exchange with them these questionnaires to kind of get an idea of their environment and what they're looking to get out of the pen test. And the most important thing is we sign a contract, you know, a written contract that's giving us permission to do what we're doing and also explaining that the customer knows what's going on. That's probably the most important part of the pen test because that keeps you uh, legally, you know, out of trouble. So, you know, going out and doing it as a hobby is fine, but you still need to treat it as if it's a professional 
uh, engagement because you want to have written permission to be doing what it is you're doing. So we start out that way and then we go into the uh, organization or we go after their resources and we find um, where the vulnerabilities exist in their resources. So first is identifying where all their stuff is. If it's an internal engagement or a gray box, we would just simply scan like IP blocks or ranges of IP addresses to see what's there, look for vulnerabilities on those things, and then attempt to exploit those vulnerabilities. Whatever we're able to exploit, we write a report up on it, explain how we got in, give them details of what we're able to do once we got in, and then give recommendations in the report on how to mitigate and fix those vulnerabilities. So that's generally in a nutshell what it is. Um, so that's what the process looks like, generally from a standpoint of doing ethical hacking. Now, would you say the skills and concepts are the same to those that you've seen in the in the past or, um, you know, skills that you learned for ethical hacking several years ago? Do you still do those same skills? Yeah, we do. Um, and I would say most of the skills are the same, you know, as far as because at the end of the day, you're, you're primarily looking for things. You're identifying what those things are. You're finding vulnerabilities in those things and then you're exploiting those. And from that standpoint, the skill set to just be able to go through that 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 path, that process, and know what tools to use when that really hasn't changed much at all. Uh, we, you know, even if we're testing, um, you know, cloud applications or web applications, we're still using Nmap. We're still using Metasploit Pro and and all the other tools that we use. As a matter of fact, most of the tool vendors in the cybersecurity space they've migrated to cloud as well, so they have cloud versions, you know, of their software. Right. <clears throat> okay. Very yeah. cool. Um, now, I guess one of the main questions, and, and probably why a lot of people are watching this webinar, um, is how do you build a successful ethical hacking career? Um, and is this something you can get into with with little to no, you know, experience in that space? Yeah, I think you can get into it um, with little to no experience, but you also have to have realistic expectations. You know, nobody's going to hire you as a as a senior pen tester. Um, right. You have no experience, right? No matter how many certifications you get, like the certifications are not going to magically um, give you the job. But the certifications will, you know, give you like a foundational understanding. They will also sure. open you up to networking opportunities to where you meet people that, you know, perhaps have the ability to hire pen testers and people like that. So definitely do it. But just be realistic and understand that you're not gonna, you know, jump right into it with no experience and in a year be a senior pen tester. Now that could happen, but it's not the norm. You know, like there's that's just like saying that everybody's gonna be a Kobe Bryant, you know, or a LeBron James. Like 99% of the players in the NBA will never, you know, excel to that level. So, right. but for the rest of us, you know, the the most of us, there is certain things you can do. Um, First of all, actually sitting down and taking your time and mastering the technical hands-on stuff. And our skills platform is actually perfect for that because you can kind of do it in sections. And I think that's one of the big challenges with traditional learning is, you know, we take people and we put them in a room for five days and we, we fire hose them with all this stuff. And maybe 10% of it sticks, you know, they might pass and get the certification, but maybe 10% of the information sticks. And then they're sure. expected to go past that and, and master that skill. Whereas really how we learn, I think best for the most part is if we can absorb that information in small chunks at our own pace. So I, I think the one of the most important things is make sure as you're learning, you go at your pace, go at a pace that's conducive for you to learn. And that's gonna be different for some people. It's not gonna be the same for everyone. Um, Someone asked me once, how long does it take to go from nothing to being a pen tester? Hmm. And I'm very hesitant to answer that because I think it varies so much on the individual, how much time you have to put into it, you know, how technical of a background you have. You know, if you've already done network engineering or application development and you're coming into pen testing, well, surely your arc is going to be, you know, faster than someone that, that has no technical hands-on experience whatsoever. So um, what I always tell people is like, look, shoot me an email, send me your resume, and I'll give you a custom response to that question uh, because I don't like okay. to do the generic ones because people get set up for thinking they're going to come in and do, you know, what you did, you know, with you having maybe a, a development background. 
and they don't have that and they see a different result. So the main thing is, you know, take as many uh, online courses and things like that as you can to see like what it's all about. You might even jump into it and figure out, you know what, I don't really think this is for me anymore. Like maybe I wanna do instant response or policy or something like that. And we want that. Like those of us mm -hmm. in the industry, we want you to find like what you like. Like if you don't like pen testing, I don't wanna hire you as a pen tester, <laughs> you know, no matter how technical you are. So I think one thing is finding out if you really wanna do it. And then once you know that, um, get the hands on with the, the labs and things like that. Look for trainings that are lab focused because you can sit and watch me do something all day uh, and think you understand it, but you really don't understand it until you can sit down and do it. And not only that, explain it to someone else. So um, look for training that's, that's heavy lab focused, you know, um, start with that, you know, start with basic things like learning the Windows command line, learning the Linux command line, understanding networking, you know, all the foundational stuff. Um, because if you jump too fast, what ends up happening, and I've seen this happen over and over and over again, and I, and I was talking to some other people from InfoSec uh, last week, mm -hmm. and we kind of calculated out that I've been, I've certified and had upwards of like 12,000 people, you know, go through courses over the right. years taught. <clears throat> so that gives us like a pretty good visit, you know, view of like how people progress. Some of those people have went on to become CISOs, some CEOs of big companies. And I hear their stories and hear like what they wish they would have done differently and stuff like that. And I think one of the things that I keep hearing over and over again is don't move from step one to step two until you truly master step one. Uh, we're in such a hurry to go fast and get that cert and get that title and get in that job role that you get in it and you're kind of struggling, you know, while you're in that job role because you know you don't necessarily have those skill set that you were supposed to get along the way. So start with the foundational stuff, you know, understand how networks work. And by the way, that's changing. Uh, when I say how networks work, you know, when we talk about software defined networking in the cloud, that's gonna be a completely different picture than your traditional Cisco Juniper understanding how that equipment works. So um, I think starting with those things, start off, you know, jump into cloud services right away, like don't wait, like don't wait until like, well, I'm gonna go through my security process Process, then I'm going to start learning cloud. Start learning cloud stuff right now. And the reason I say that is because you can jump, you can go right this second. Like you can go to aws.amazon.com or azure.microsoft.com or cloud.google.com and you can set up an account and start practicing that stuff right away, like right this second. So with that accessibility uh, and with the great opportunities that that'll give you, I think people should definitely start that right away and just kind of do it in parallel with like, learning how to you know work on operating systems and learning how to do scans and uh, networking and stuff like that don't uh don't be afraid of the challenge you know jump into it and just take your time and be comfortable with the fact that this might take you more time than other people i mean i will tell you i'm a slow learner like when i learn things it takes me a long time like i have to go through things 10 times in a row before right. it sticks. but the advantage is is once it sticks, then I never lose it. Like it's there forever. My sister is the opposite. She picks up things like instantaneously, but she forgets things a lot faster. So don't be afraid to understand and embrace who you are and how you learn. And then take advantage of that. Like take that and and you know run with that in your in your quest to learn this stuff. Yeah, Keith, and I think that's some great advice. And I think uh, you know one other thing that people have to remember is nobody's path is is the same regardless of what you do. And and you know there's some great resources for recommended paths or you know more common stepping stones and things. But I think overall, um, you know, you have to find what works for you. And and there's a lot of different ways that you can transition into this. Is what I'm taking away from from kind of what you shared there. Oh, absolutely. My best pen tester, you know, she was a, um, her background was nothing technical. Like she was sure. a liberal arts major. She taught uh, drama, you know, at, a, at a community college, but she tinkered, you know, she was a technology tinkerer. So she experimented with technology on the side as a hobby. And when she came in for the interview, looking at her resume or background, she was the least qualified for sure. Right. And um, over time, you know, over like the next year, 
The reason I hired her is because when I bring people in for an interview, there's kind of like a, a little technical test that I give you where you where I give you a machine, some IP addresses and some other things. And you have to figure out how to find these things, scan them, find vulnerabilities, exploit the vulnerabilities. While she was pretty behind on doing that, her approach and her problem solving skills were kind of out the roof. Like I could see that sure. she, the way she was approaching it, she would have eventually gotten it, you know. I only give like two hours to do it, but if she would have had eight hours, she for sure would have done it and probably done a better job than all the other candidates that had like right. many years experience. So I saw that and, you know, I took a chance and hired her and now she's like the top, um, you know, the best pen tester. And she got to that position like in a very short amount of time. So she had least amount of experience, came in knowing nothing, but had a good approach to learning and problem solving shadowed me for like six months and now she's you know within a year she had passed people that have been doing uh pen testing for 10 15 years uh just sure. in her innovation and the way she approached things so absolutely don't listen to any of this stuff about well you got to do this for 12 years and then you got to move into that there's some truth to that and there's some value to that but understand that there are many different ways to get there the main thing is that you dig into it and you actually start practicing get your hands on Watching people do things is not the same as you actually doing it. Sure. Well, that's a good transition, I think, into, you know, um, a lot of people know that certification is a great pathway to get into the industry, right? And, and it is going to be a requirement in the majority of cases for, you know, that job in ethical hacking or, or that sort of thing. Um, and these are great opportunities to prove your skills as well. So can you talk a little bit about the difference, um, or not the difference, excuse me, about like the different types of certifications and uh, like the CompTIA pen test plus cert um, or other pen testing, you know, certs and things you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> the pen test plus is a good uh, addition to the, the pen testing certification kind of uh, bowl of certifications because it adds, I think that they focus uh, a little bit more on you know, things on the front end of the engagement, like the documentation, the stuff that you should request from a customer, um, how you should do your contracts and things like that. I think they focus on that more than other certifications. And I also think that on the technical side, they focus a lot more on scripting and stuff like that than some of the others do. Um, but in addition, but aside from that, things like Nmap and all of your exploitation stuff, I think they're right in line with everyone else, but that's some of the areas they're different in. So I think it's it's definitely a good addition. We actually offer it like our pen testing courses now, or our CEH course is actually CEH Pen Test Plus. So it's a dual certification where you leave with, with getting both of the certs essentially. And it's a great addition to that. Um, there's the others out there. There's the OSCP, um, you know, the eLearn Security, all of these ones, some of them are a lot more hands-on. For example, the OSCP is just a lab. Like you have to go in and do these things. And I think that's great for proving, right, that you can do something. Right. But that, but a lot of times, you know, the certifications or the trainings where you're actually validating and proving yourself aren't necessarily the best ones to teach you, right? So mm -hmm. some people are coming into the industry saying, oh, I'm going for OSCP because my guy that's been in the industry for 10 years just got OSCP and he said it's way better than CEH and Pentest Plus. Well, yeah, but that person started with CEH and Pentest Plus. So if they didn't have that background, they didn't have those basic skills first, their opinion of OSCP and some of the others might be different, right? So I think that part of it is just understanding that when you're coming in as a new person, your learning path and the things that you need to learn are gonna be different than someone that's been in it 10 years already. So you can't right. necessarily listen to that advice because while those people may be great at what they're doing, they're not necessarily good at they're not career advisors. They're not trainers. Yeah. They're not good at taking you and bringing you along the path. Um, if you look at some of the best jazz musicians, like if you listen to them and talk to them and listen to people who have interviewed them and try to study on them, they'll tell you like, you know, yeah, Dizzy Gillespie's like has the fastest fingers ever on piano, but mm -hmm. you know, this person tried to study on them for five years and says the worst instructor he's ever had. Yeah. So just because you can perform doesn't mean you can can train and bring other people in. So I think that different certifications have a different place. I think they all kind of are starting to fit together nicely as different ones kind of find what their niche is. 
But for sure today, still entry-level pen testing, CEH is still kind of like the go-to one. Um, and a lot of that's got to do with not, you know, I don't like to try to compare or slam people's certifications, but what's right. happened is it's been around for a long time. So it's kind of baked into the fabric of if you're going to come into this organization doing any type of offensive security, you got to have CEH as a as an entry level. I mean, there's 8570 for DOD and all these others that just require it. So because of those things, as well as it is still a good cert, if you get the good right training, you're under the right instructor and you're exposed to the right stuff, it's still a really good certification for people entering into the industry. Um, Again, don't listen to those people that's been in the industry for 20 years and they started with CEH and they kind of cut their teeth with it and got their opportunity with CEH. And now 20 years later, like, oh, that's garbage, don't do that. Well, it's maybe for you because you have that, you know, 20 years experience, but remember, we're trying to bring people in as well. And that's what we need in the industry. We have such a huge shortage that we're trying to, to make it easier to transition people in. And I think Pentest Plus, CEH are still like the best certifications for that. Perfect. Uh, now, before we get to the, the next question here, Keetron, I'll bring in a question from Sumeda. Um, are these entry-level certifications or are there prerequisites that you would recommend uh, before these? So I definitely recommend some pre, even if you don't get prerequisite certifications, I definitely recommend prerequisite knowledge, right? So right. the knowledge that comes along with having a security plus, a network plus, you definitely need that baseline of knowledge because when you come into something like a CEH, it's not, it's entry level to pen testing, but it's not entry level into IT or entry level okay. into security. So there are certain cybersecurity terminologies, certain cybersecurity uh, understandings that you're expected to already have when you come into something like a CEH. So definitely you need foundational understandings of how these things work. You need some basic Linux, you know, hands-on, some basic Windows command line hands-on, just very sure. basic. You know, you don't need to be an expert with Linux or an expert. You just need to have went and watch some videos, learn how to run some commands and learn how to find stuff on that operating system. And, you know, that's one that, like I said, a lot of the free stuff that I offer on LinkedIn and other places is really just trying to give people that foundation so that right. when you come to us at InfoSec to take Security Plus or whatever training we're offering, you already have like enough foundation that you'll be more successful in those classes. Sure, perfect. Well, thank you. That I think that'll uh, answer Sumeda's question, so appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to the future of this. So if someone's looking to get into the industry or looking to get into this, you know, career path, um, what can they expect to see in your opinion in the future? Um, so I think again, cloud is gonna be the big thing. So I think you definitely have to start, you know, I think you have to marry yourself to cloud technologies now, uh, get a head start on that. To where, I mean, even when I show people how to build a practice environment, right? To, if you wanna learn pen testing, if you wanna learn technical security, what type of lab should I build? And what I tell them is build a lab in one of the cloud services. Because in addition to you building a lab to practice your hacking and your pen testing and your forensics in, you're also learning cloud services in the process of building that lab in that environment. And that is going to be an absolutely critical skill now I've got I've got some pretty uh, some of my bigger customers and I was just at one of them about three weeks ago and what they told me was look we we're a big bank we've migrated almost all of our stuff to cloud services you know almost 100 percent of it and a lot of our general IT people they're either going to have to become cybersecurity technical engineers or they're not going to have a job because <clears throat> what's ended up happening is again the traditional low level stuff like you know setting up networks and things like that this is point and click stuff in aws or azure now to where i can build a vpc put a router there drop it in give that network internet access in a matter of literally like five seconds like i don't need to know a bunch of cisco commands or anything like that so what's happening is a skill set requirement is going to transition to where your understanding of how applications work your understanding of web applications your understanding of cloud technologies in general are gonna be the things that are considered foundational to mm -hmm. your cybersecurity skill set. 
So now you're going to have to learn cloud and all these things as your foundation and then move on to cybersecurity, stacking it on top of that basic foundation understanding. Just like if I were teaching you how to hack networks, right? You would have to first understand how networks work. So this is why when we do recommended paths, we say, hey, learn basic networking, learn operating systems, and learn how to hack those things. Well, if you're going to learn how to hack things in cloud services, you need a basic understanding of how cloud services works. And if you're going to be engineering security around cloud services, you need to understand how cloud services work. So I think that's something that we're going to see shaping up in the very near future to where that's going to become a bigger and bigger thing is to where cloud is kind of like entry level foundational. You got to have this basic understanding and then you can do cyber on top of that. Sure. And now, how are you seeing, if any, a shift in people training for this? Um, I know at InfoSec, you know, hands-on online learning has been a big hit. Cybersecurity pros are so busy because there's, you know, not all that many of them that they don't all the time, you know, have the ability to sit down for five, six days. Um, so what is your opinion on, you know, the online learning versus the classroom style learning? Yeah, I think the, I think the skills, uh, platform that we've rolled out at, at InfoSec is is kind of where it's going to be in the future because again you get to absorb the stuff at your own pace and the way that we work in this field is especially for learning right like we don't necessarily have time during the day to learn because we're putting out fires and and doing all these Left other and right yeah yeah but it's but most of us if the company gives us you know like an account to a cloud guru or infosec skills or something like that if we have that skills account, we will spend our own time in the evenings or at night or at 2 a.m. when we can't sleep, just sitting and going through tutorials, going through labs. So I think that that's gonna become more and more the norm. That's where people are gonna want to do it more online because they have uh, full access to it at, you know, kind of on demand uh, when they need access to the training. Even with our flex uh, learning, you know, one of the, the, the main selling points of it and one of the things that's a big hit with the students is the fact that when you take, like if you took CEH and Pentest Plus for me, um, one of the things you get with Flex Online is you get me live like we are now, but right. you also get all of that recorded. So every, all 12 hours of that day is recorded and you have access to it for as long as you need access to it. You know, so months after the class, you can go back and watch the videos of our interactions, the questions you might've asked and that type thing and um, just kind of refresh that. And I think that's the future of learning is the ability to sit down, go through small chunks of data versus like a big, you know, 40 hours of it. Uh, and that's that's just kind of what we become more conditioned to as well with the, the short media news cycles and social media. We kind of just learn. We're used to taking small amounts of information at a time and then using that to make decisions and move forward with it. We don't have the attention span to do 40 hours, you know, properly sure. anymore. Uh, I mean, we do, we can do it. We can discipline ourselves to sit down and do it. But if you look at the amount of that we're absorbing and we're able to take and translate what Keytron is saying, what Keytron is showing me, now let me sit down at the keyboard and integrate that into my job. The rate of that happens, I think, at a much higher rate when we do it kind of like in short chunks versus a big blob of it. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I think it's also, you know, again, as you mentioned earlier, what works best for that person to, you know, some people need that real structured um, sit down boot camp style class and some people are, are great at learning on their own. So figuring out what works for you is, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one day we'll have it like the Matrix where you can, you know, mm -hmm. you can, I can sit in a chair, stick a thing in my head and suck out everything and then somebody else can sit in that chair and get all that information in their head and immediately go apply it. But until we get to that, you know, right. I think this is the closest thing that we're going to have to it. Right. You get working on that invention and let us know when you're, when you're yeah, done yeah, with that. <laughs> um, well, now we're kind of at the point in the presentation where we are hoping that you could, you know, show us on uh, a demo of what you might do as, um, you know, an ethical hacker, pen tester, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and change the presenter over to you. Sure. And if you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what you're going to show us today. Yeah, so I'm going to kind of show um, what it looks like to do 
we're going to kind of combine cross-site scripting, watering hole attacks, okay. and essentially uh, mix that with, um, you know, Metasploit and some other things. And part of that, part of the reason I do this in classes now is because, you know, this is what we do with customers. When we go out and we do pen tests and we show them things, like, for example, we find cross-site scripting on their website, just having Burp Suite run, do that cross-site scripting finding, and then tell them you have cross-site scripting, go fix it. A lot of times the customers don't get the urgency that, because they don't understand what that actually is. And no sure. matter how much you talk to them about it, they don't get it. So I'm going to, I've kind of designed a little uh, world here where, like you know, Camille's, <laughs> Camille's website here, Camille sells uh, trinkets or whatever the case may be. Um, and you have Camille's customers that visit that site and we're going to use this to show what cross-site scripting is. Now, this is just a little overview before I get into the actual demo. <clears throat> so what happens is, you know, Camille's customers will visit her site and absorb content. Now, let's say Camille's site happens to have a cross-site scripting vulnerability in there. So because of the way that, you know, her developers design their sites, she's got some cross-site scripting vulns in it. So what happens is Keytron finds those. And what that essentially allows Keytron to do is to put comments, like I can post a comment, that basically, you know, points to uh, Keytron's website. You know, my bad website. So okay. I'm able to post a script tag or just even like, I'll actually, I'll do it with an iframe. So we're able to post an iframe or a comment that says, go visit Keytron's website. So now when one of Camille's customers visits Camille's website, they're now also loading a copy of Keytron's website because what happens is when you visit a website, you're actually taking that entire HTML and you're pulling it down to your machine and you're loading it into memory on your machine. That's what your browser is actually doing is it's pulling it down into memory so you can see it here. Well, guess what? That red that represents the bad thing that points to Keytron's website, you've now ingested that into memory on your machine because of this cross-site scripting. That's problem. gone gone back with it. Yep. So now what happens is that code that says go pull Keytron site will execute. Suddenly now your customer, Camille, is loading a copy of guess whose site in memory because I've got my site hidden in your site in the form of an iframe. So now that customer of yours has my malicious website in memory. And that malicious website simply runs code that says send Keytron command and control. And at that point, that machine is mine. It belongs to Keytron because now Keytron can sit right on his machine here and mm -hmm. just run commands that will translate over to this machine. So he's taking control of, so the point that we have to show customers is like, look, the fact that you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability and it says that it's a minimal or a medium vulnerability, that may be true, but you need to understand that for your customers, it's probably a critical because you're not gonna get exploited. I'm not gonna be able to exploit Camille because of Camille's cross-site scripting vulnerability. I'm gonna be exploiting Camille's customers or anyone else that visits her site. So once we explain that to customers, then they get it. It's like a light bulb comes on. It's like, oh, okay, now we see why it's a bad thing. So sure. what I wanna do is actually demonstrate to you how fast that can actually happen. Now, this is gonna be your customer that's here they're going to be visiting um your website okay this is your website that i'm about to visit here so i'm simply going to post a comment i'm the attacker okay and i'm simply going to post a comment here that essentially just basically in html says go and visit keytron's website now, I'm not going to do this in JavaScript or anything complex. I want to show you just how simple it is. If you took a 30-minute introduction to HTML class, you would learn how to do iframes. So it's mm -hmm. basically saying this, and I'm just saying point to Keytron's website, which for this demo is at this IP address. Okay. And it's listening on that port, and it's going to that URL. All right, so that's all I'm saying there. 
and I'm going to sign the guest book. All right, so I, I put my comment on your website there. Well, maybe I need to, my login timed out, yeah. And so this would be something that would commonly kind of be on, you know, a smaller company's website is, you know, send us a message or leave us a note or, or that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Any Anywhere where you're allowing uh, a customer to put, you know, feedback or, or anything like that. And w another place that this is commonly done or where you commonly see it happen is on companies' Facebook pages, right? So I'll, okay. post, I'll post something on the InfoSec or Camille's Facebook page that'll be like, hey, look at this video of someone uh, taking a class at Camille's training. And mm -hmm. it won't actually be a video of that. It'll be a video of that, but also on that same website, there's an iframe like this that points to Keytron's bad site. Because you can't really post bad code on Facebook, but what you can post is links to other pages, right? right. So that, that's another common way that you see this actually play out. So as you can see, the iframe posted. Now, this is your website, Camille, that I just posted mm -hmm. this comment on, all right? On the surface, it looks harmless. So now one of your customers is going to go and visit that same site. So they log into their account on, well, as soon as I get the uh, IP address right here. So they log into Camille's Trinket website. You know, they go and visit the same page that I posted on. And just from visiting that page, right? Just from mm -hmm. visiting that page, they've loaded my iframe here. Just from loading that iframe, they've pulled malicious code from Keytron's malicious site into their browser session. And because of that, what's happening on the attacker side is the following. Now on Keytron's machine, I've actually got control of your site, of your customer's computer here as they visit it. Sure, wow. So now as this thing is loading that you see here, it's sending stage, which means it's sending some malicious payload. Now I've got what we call an interpreter session, which means I own that machine now because at this point I can connect to that session. I can now do things like take a screenshot of your customer's machine Right, I can see what's on their screen. And so that might be if, you know, if they were entering payment to pay for one of my trinkets or something, you'd take a screenshot of that and have their credit card info. Absolutely, or I just might do this. I might say run keylogger. Mm. Because I'm essentially in their machine now. So if I ran that, all right, what that customer might do. So not only entering payment on your site, but let's say they go to your Chase account or their Bank of America account or whatever, Let's just go play. That's a good question. So let's just go play customer one more time. So we're sure. going to visit another site. I'm going to open up Chrome here and we're going to go to our Chase Bank account. And I'm going to sign in. Put in my username. Password is one, two, three, four, five, right? Yeah, exactly. So I good. log in yeah, good one. and I know all the attendees are like, is he going to really give us his password? Absolutely <laughs> not. So we just logged in our Chase account here. You know, I, I put in the wrong information, but pretend we did put in the right information. So right. we just logged in. Well, guess what the attacker gets to see? Back on the attacker screen, all right, since he's having these keystrokes logged to his computer, he can actually just go and open this file here. So I'm just going to open another terminal here and go read that actual file. And there's all those keystrokes. So we can see where they went to chase.com. We can say they logged in with the username of Keytron. 
and then we can see the password is not a chance. As in <laughs> not a chance, I'm going to give it to you. That's a good password. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now everything that that person types, everything that they do, I, I can record it right here and have that information. Not only that, I could literally drop into that machine and run commands. Like I could go, you know, uh, just give me the name of like one participant in the webinar, like just the first name. Uh, let's see, Jacob. I see a question from him that we'll get to in a minute here, but let's use Jacob. All right, so we're gonna, I'm just gonna make a directory on the desktop named Jacob. And I'm gonna create a text file. It says, hello, Jake. And put that right on the desktop as well. So now, just to prove that we have control of the machine, if we go back and play customer again and look at the desktop, <clears throat> you can see there's a folder named Jacob there. Oh, yeah. So we did do that, and there should be a text file too. I might have fat fingered the uh, command on that, <laughs> which is, you know, something that happens commonly with me. Let's see here. Yeah. So um, anyway, we did all those things. We got the screenshot. We got the we got your login to your bank account. Pretty much, we own your computer at this point. And if you look at it from the standpoint of how we started, remember the point was this is not happening to you, Camille. This is happening to your customers. Right. Like and I might not even know this is happening. You may not even know. So all of your customers that are visiting your site. <laughs> This could be potentially happening then because you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. And what makes it even worse is instead of having this sent to Keytron's bad site on a little web server that Keytron's got on his portal, guess where this ends up being? Now what they're doing is they're putting their malicious websites in places like AWS or Azure. or Google Cloud, you know? So in other words, Keytrans and Malicious Websites lives at aws.amazon.com, um, you know, or something like that, which is what, sure. what you're used to seeing anyway. I mean, if you've ever watched Netflix, you stream stuff from aws.amazon.com. So now they're hiding kind of in plain sight by utilizing cloud services to where this cross-site scripting vulnerability that's exploited now points to somewhere in AWS or somewhere in Google or somewhere in Microsoft Azure, which makes it harder for you to track it if you're investigating this attack. So that's kind of some of the new, the things that we're, we're teaching in the, the ethical hacking and the pen test plus right. to make it to where not only as a student, you know, will you have the ability to go out and do these things, but you also increase your ability to demonstrate and explain to your customer what is actually going on versus just giving them a report. Because one of the things that happens in this industry a lot of times is we're so busy and pressing each other that we forget about who we're supposed to be doing the service for. Right? <laughs> like the pen test report looks like magic to another pen tester, but to that customer that's absorbing that report, they don't know heads or tails of what any of that means. So just taking five minutes for me to do a demonstration like this for a customer versus a hundred pages, of explaining it is worth the effort because I get that customer over and over and over again because they understand now, you know, what it is. Right. And I think that's so important, you know, the way you said understanding and, and being able to learn and teach. So I know you touched on that earlier, um, but I think the soft skills of cybersecurity is, is where you're working a lot of times with people who don't know what's going on. They're, they're very frightened of, you know, am I being hacked? What is happening? That sort of thing. The way that you were able to explain this, you know, to myself, who is not, not very technical, um, you know, made sense. And I think that that's what's really important 
is, you know, not only can you pass the exam and say, yes, this is the right answer, but then you can say, this is the right answer because this is how you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, so that's it for the demo if you want to take control back here. Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you. That was that was really interesting, and I think it gave a good um, a good showing of you know just how easy it is for someone to unfortunately um, you know take advantage of uh, someone's website or someone's um, you know different things that they own. So thank you. Um, let's see. Back on to the next slide then. So we've got some questions coming through and please continue to submit those. So we are gonna go ahead and uh, take some questions, then we'll announce the winner of the one year trial of InfoSec Skills. Um, so thanks to everyone who's asked questions so far, keep them coming. We have a few minutes here to go through these. Um, so let me start with one of the first questions here on, um, is there any specific cloud tech to cut your teeth on? So Amazon, Google, Azure, and that question is from Dan. Yeah, so <clears throat> to remain vendor neutral here as much as possible, um, right. I would, so let me just, for me personally, I have the stronger background in Amazon with AWS. That's just because when I got introduced to cloud, that's what it was. Um, right. That was a major player. But I think that now, all three of the major ones, which would be Google, Amazon, and um, Microsoft, I think they're all three relatively easy to, um, I, I have certifications in all of them and, I, and I've um, used all of them for various things. So I don't think any one of them is necessarily easier to, to utilize than the other, but I would say go to the AWS website, go to the Azure website, go to the Google Cloud and just type in, you know, how do I set up an account? And just go ahead and set up that first account, set up one in all three, um, and then spend 30 minutes on each one and figure out which platform you like better. And whichever one that just seems to fit you naturally and you seem to like better, don't worry about trying to read on other people's opinions. Take the one that feels best to you and just go with it. Go deep into that one and then come back and backfill on the other two. Um, I think we spend so much time trying to analyze like, oh, well, which one should I do and which one's better? Go with the one that feels right. You know, like I said, spend 30 minutes on each one in their intro. Like, okay, here's Azure. Let me start with that. Let me see if I can stand up a VM and reach it from the internet. Here's AWS. Let me see if I can stand up a VM here. Here's Google. Let me see if I can stand up one here. Go through that process of doing something very basic like that and then rate them on which one you think was easier and better for you to, to be able to do it. And then just go full steam ahead with that one. I think that's the, the best way to approach that. Sure, perfect. Um, so Dan, hopefully that, that question helped you out there. Um, now, another question that came through on the chat here is, what are the different attack types um, that are most common with, with what you just shared? Um, let's see. So how are the attack types that you shared in the demo um, what are they mostly used for? Is it for getting money? Is it for getting personal information? Um, what is the most common thing that can happen to a person? I think they're used a lot for, uh, you know, getting credit card information, getting PII, so that they can either sell it or set up, you know, fake credit in your name and stuff like that, but also just intellectual property theft. Um, one of the things we're okay. seeing happen in the enterprise is these types of attacks that you just saw are happening like on public hotspots in places like that. Like you go to Starbucks or somewhere like that and get on the Wi-Fi, they're cross-site scripting that little Starbucks welcome page, you know, where you uh, have to agree that, um, that you are gonna follow their rules or whatever. They're doing things there now to where they're getting you this way. And a lot of times it's just to get at someone that works at a certain company, right? Like if I know Camille works at InfoSec and I'm trying to get into InfoSec, I might go to a website that I know Camille visits or frequents and do sure. something like that and set it up and just wait for you to go there and then get into your box so that I can get in the InfoSec. So most of these attacks are either being used to get financial information, credit card information, or they're using them as a pivot point to eventually get into an organization uh, that oh, wow. works at. Okay. Um, and now are these pages, is this different than like a phishing page, right? So in the demo, what you showed us, they don't actually have to create a lookalike page to Chase Bank or that sort of thing. 
they're just taking taking the info right from the real one. Right from the real one, because the real page is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Because part of what I showed there, the fact that I'm able to do cross-site scripting, when I did the whole attack, it's actually called the watering hole attack, right? So when you hear that term in the industry, watering hole, that's essentially what the attack was. But I was okay. able to do a watering hole attack because of the fact that a cross-site scripting vulnerability existed there, right? And where watering hole comes from is if you can imagine the smart lions in the desert, they don't chase <laughs> animals around the desert. They wait at the oasis. They wait at the watering hole for the gazelle to come there and drink, and then they pounce on them, right? So right. that's what we just they did They know there. they're going to come there. Yeah, instead of me chasing your customers, Camille, I just waited at your site for them to come there, and then I pounced on them when they hit your site via that cross-site scripting. So it was a cross-site scripting vulnerability that we exploited. It was a cross-site scripting attack, but overall, it was a watering hole attack. And again, that's sure. another confusing thing in the industry is people don't explain that stuff. Like when you hear watering hole, you think it's something completely different, but what you just saw was actually a watering hole attack made possible by a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Okay, okay, very cool. Yeah. Um, thank you. Looks like we have time for just a couple of more questions and, and thank you to everyone who submitted. We might not get to all of them, um, but we will try our best here. So quite a few people are asking questions on demo labs. Um, so Keytron, can you talk a little bit about how you recommend people try this out or learn yeah, this? Absolutely. So, a so the best way, and of course I'm biased on this here, the best way is to sign up for our InfoSec skills because mm -hmm. actually uh, in some of the court skills paths that I authored, I go through these things, I explain them in detail, and we provide you a lab environment to practice it. Now, if you want to build your own lab environment, I can help you with that as well. But the easiest way to immediately get right into it is sign up for our skills path, uh, go look at the ethical hacking stuff, and I actually go through all of this stuff. Now, I didn't, I'm not the only one in the ethical hacking path, it's me and some other instructors, right. but I definitely go through some of the stuff in uh, in that past skills path. And, be, and if you do sign up, make sure you use my discount code because you can actually uh, get 50% off of your skill subscription if you use my code. Sure, and we'll get to that code in, in just a moment here. So uh, looking like the the time is, is getting towards the end. So um, Let's get one last question in and then we will go ahead to the drawing and share some information about um, that code that Keytron mentioned. Um, so let's go ahead to the question of the different backgrounds that you've seen go into ethical hacking. A lot of people are, are kind of asking, um, telling a little bit about their specific experience um, and you know, are there other backgrounds? You mentioned that your best pen tester, for example, was was from a totally different background. Um, but is there one that you would say is more common that you see transition into ethical hacking? Yeah, it's people that have a background in network engineering or, you know, when we say ethical hacking, that includes web app now. So people sure. that have a strong development background tend to transition right into uh, web app security and app security. Or we call it AppSec. So definitely network engineering uh, and some type of development role are like the most transitionary roles that we see coming into ethical hacking. But you know, it doesn't, that absolutely doesn't mean that that's, that, that just excludes you because you don't meet that criteria. It's just that I think that's more of a natural transition for people. And they're also the ones that would, that would be most likely to have information about it, right? If, you're, if your job is to, um, you know, if you're an, if you're an accountant, you would probably be less likely to even know what certified ethical hacker is than someone that's you know a network engineer. So I think a lot of it's just because those people are kind of closer to the field, so it's they know have more information, they have more uh, insight to go into it. But don't let that shy any of you away from it. I you know I have a firm belief that literally anyone, no matter what your background or what your skill level is, can get into this industry and do this very thing. And like I said, I've got a, a personal effort, a for free personal effort to kind of get people that feel like they don't to the point to where they can come to someone like InfoSec and really take advantage of the amazing course offerings and stuff like that that we have and specifically that skills platform. Right. Well, thank you, Keytron, for answering all of our questions here. And I, I think we got to a lot of them. So um, thank you to all the guests who, who asked us a question.